Let's start. So welcome everybody to a workshop on computing challenges. Uh, my name is Ihab Ilyas. I'm from QCRI uh, here in Qatar. And uh, this workshop is in uh, a specific topic within, uh, within uh, uh, challenges of uh, computing. And we focus on uh, computing challenges that has to do with data uh, from acquisition uh, all the way to scalable computing and scalable processing. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that we would like our uh, distinguished speakers uh, in this workshop to uh, uh, shed some light uh, on. Basically, we'll be focusing on where this data is coming from, how to acquire this data. So we'll be talking about data acquisition uh, from multiple, in multiple environments and from multiple sources. Uh, with, with this data getting larger, we'd like to understand more how to uh, provide scalable infrastructure uh, to process and munch on this data and produce something useful for it. We're going to also talk about some interesting uh, um, uh, untraditional environment for finding uh, data, especially social web uh, 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 and, uh, and, and other sources that uh, we usually don't think of uh, as uh, traditional data sources. And uh, we're going to close with uh, some comments on how to take data from its raw format to knowledge that will allow communication in a knowledge-based society. Data is an important asset, and that's why we chose uh, that asset to be the main focus of that workshop. Today, we're very fortunate to have uh, speakers that um, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, briefly. And uh, uh, while I'm introducing them, this is a quote from uh, their own presentation that they chose to represent what they're talking about. So I'll leave you, I'll, I'll leave you with this uh, quote while I'm introducing them. Our first speaker is Dr. Lou Tucker. Uh, Lou is a CTO, cloud computing at Cisco, uh, a world leader in cloud computing, a uh, long career. I don't have the time or to, to introduce all, everything he did. Uh, before Cisco, who was CTO, cloud computing, and Sun Systems, uh, and, and many other accomplishments. And uh, Lou's going to focus on scalable computing. So we're going to take the, dis the discussions and the talks will will handle uh, these challenges backwards. We'll talk about how to provide scalable computing first, and then we'll tell you how, where the data is coming from. Uh, our second uh, distinguished speaker is uh, Professor Christopher Ray. Uh, uh, Chris is an assistant professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison, graduated from University of Washington, Seattle. He's a rising star in databases. And, uh, and uh, uh, he has interesting stuff to say to us about data analytics and bringing uh, reasoning closer to data in its natural habitat. Our third speaker is uh, Dr. Siam Amir Yahya from our own Siam Amir Yahya from QCRI. Uh, Siam is a principal scientist on the social computing group here in Qatar. And she came, uh, she has also a very long successful career we're very proud of. Uh, she came uh, as principal scientist at Yahoo. Before that, she was in at and t uh, and, and, uh, and she graduated from India, France. Uh, um, she's also a database person, which is close to my heart. And uh, last but not least, our also own Dr. Stefan Vogel. Uh, Stefan is a principal scientist of the Natural Language Processing Group at QCRI, uh, coming from CMU Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, Stefan will have the grand finale of telling us how to uh, take this data in raw format and how to do the global digital village. Only him knows what that means. So, uh, <laughs> so just for the interest and respect of your time, uh, uh, we have 90 minutes in this workshop and divided by the four speakers. And uh, that means around 20 minutes uh, uh, um, uh, for, for, for each talk. And we're going to take a, a, a one or two questions in transition between talks. Um, so thanks again for coming. And I'd like to start talk. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think I wanted to lead off here with some just general thoughts about um, cloud computing because I think it's very integral to any kind of large-scale data analysis that we're doing. I sort of have a hypothesis that actually as we get into very large-scale data sets, 
that we might see some very new ways to sort of approach a lot of these problems. We're seeing a lot more, my background is actually also in artificial intelligence and statistical pattern recognition, and it really requires an awful lot of data. So, but I wanted to do a little retrospective as well in terms of, of giving the context for this. A lot of people who are looking at cloud computing are actually making an analogy with a transition to electrical power generation and grids and things like that. Um, those of us who remember the turn of the century and the Industrial Revolution, when we moved to electrical power, in fact, every business had to have, when they, to power the motors that were replacing the looms, they had to have their own power generation capabilities. These were largely steam or water-driven kind of turbines. And that means that they had to have their own electrical engineers, even though they were a manufacturer or something else, man, you know, basically providing their own power. Um, that's what we're at today. Every company seems to have its own data center and is essentially managing its own computing infrastructure. And what happened with electrical power was as the technology improved and also distribution was introduced through kind of these national kinds of grids, we started seeing computer, you know, the power generation moving to like municipalities, to cities and to states and eventually to national grids, whereby now Now we actually are seeing it so that you no longer have to generate your own electrical power and we really commoditize that so that you can just use the power and, and get out of the business of generation yourself. So we are at the beginning, I think, of this major shift. And this is a hypothetical adoption curve. I really don't know the shape of this curve nor the time course. Uh, but it is talking about a shift between traditional data centers, the way enterprises run things today, and this kind of cloud computing model, which we'll get into shortly. Um, also, the industry moves at different different rates here. For example, startups are already up on this curve. New companies that are being formed today are very unlikely to get the capital required to make investments in infrastructure. Instead, they're being told by their funding agencies, their VCs, to basically go and get their computing in the cloud. This is a lot more efficient use of capital in the long term because for untried business models, if they are wildly successful over a very short period of time, they can ramp up very quickly. If it's not such a good business idea, in fact, they didn't waste an awful lot of capital investing in an infrastructure that was never really used. So this is, whenever you see a lot more efficient use of capital, something very deep is really going on in the society. Of course, it is overhyped. And, you know, we're probably also at the peak of this, like, height curve, soon to be followed by the valley of disillusionment and other things, kinds of things. Um, but a lot of people are really sort of saying, okay, so that solves all my problems. And in fact, it doesn't. Uh, really, it's a change in the delivery model. There's very little change in the technology. Just how computing is, is used is changing. Um, and, but don't be fooled. This is a real fundamental change. Just because there wasn't some new invention, cloud computing, which was a technology change, this is a change in how technology is actually delivered and consumed. So basic sort of definitions. What is cloud computing? A lot of people always ask me to give a definition, and I very reticent to because it's such a broad term. We apply it to everything. Uh, cloud computing, in fact, has been around since the beginning of the internet. We get applications through the internet. We get content through the internet. Uh, but if you really think about it, now we've generalized this so that it really is a model that you can not only get application access to applications, but now you would really begin to get basic computing resources through the internet itself. And that part is new. And that's something that we, the word cloud actually came from the fact that Every engineer would, you know, drawing things on a whiteboard and would draw these boxes with arrows and networks, and then there'd be this cloud, and you'd be an arrow out to the cloud and say, that represented the Internet. So now all the rest of those boxes now are going into that cloud, and that's really the phenomenon that's happening now. The other thing is that the marketplace is now setting a sort of a commodity price for computing, which means that market economics are now beginning to, to, to come to, to the foreground here. And this is on the order of 10 cents per hour which is a phenomenal price if you think about it. Actually, I was at Sun Microsystems, and about seven years ago, we were trying to do something similar, and it was a dollar an hour. Well, it shows the effects of Moore's Law over time. That's now dropped to 10 cents per hour. In fact, with Moore's Law, it'll certainly be dropping down into the penny very shortly. So this is a very, very different model in terms of how you can use computing. If you are avoiding the, the setup time and the, and the deep capital investment, instead paying only for what you use, in that kind of a model now, in other words, using 10 servers for four days is the same thing as using 1,000 servers for an hour. 
So if you have a comp, if you want, you can make that trade off. It's more important for you to get the job done quickly, pay all the money, than it is basically done, do it more slowly over time. So now we're really talking about you, you can put a price on the amount of computing or the work that is actually done, and that price is driven by the market economics. So I often think about cloud computing, I think about these two guys. Gordon Moore, Moore's Law, where we really are talking about due to the advances in semiconductors and everything else, where we've been systematically driving down essentially the cost of computing every two years, 18 months to two years, cutting it in half each time or doubling the performance, however you want to think about it. Uh, but with cloud computing now, we're also introducing Adam Smith, market economics. There's now a marketplace, and if you can generate a marketplace, that means now you have buyers and, and, and producers who basically are coming together in a marketplace and setting a price for computing. Uh, this requires actually a drive to a standardization so that you can actually have things that are reused and that multiple uh, consumers can use them. But it changes the dynamics of this very fundamentally, and that's some of the things we'll, we'll address here. So, another reality is that most businesses would rather not own their own data centers. They would rather not run data centers. It's, it's a real pain to actually operate data centers if, if basically that's not your business. Uh, this is from Don McCaskill, a friend of mine who's the CEO of a Smug Mug, which is a high-end kind of photography site. Very large raw files that are, that are loaded up into the internet. Uh, and he was really complaining. He was spending an awful lot of his time running these data centers because he had petabytes and petabytes of data. And that wasn't his business. He wanted to be providing the service to his customers. He wanted to be developing the software, which was the product for that service, and get out of the data center business entirely by putting it essentially in, into the cloud. So what's wrong with traditional data centers? It's, it's pretty obvious after, after you think about it. It starts very simple. You have an application, you put it on an operating system, and you put it on a piece of hardware and a server. And you keep bringing in more applications as you're going over time, different marketing departments or finance or whatever. But now at the end of this, you've got a real problem for this guy. Because now each one of these applications has essentially determined its own kind of micro-architecture. That means you've got, you can't move that engineering app onto that finance machine. The application that's running finance doesn't work very well in that marketing architecture. So these things all have very poor overall utilization. They're very inefficient. At night, they're mostly sitting idle and not doing anything. And yet this guy has to maintain all of that complexity. So as computer scientists, we almost always solve problems like that by creating what's known as another level of indirection. We create another layer, and we try to separate out the two concerns. So at the base, what we're doing is that make that all about the physical infrastructure. That's where we're going to put all of the machines, and now force the applications to live up in this kind of virtual world on top of a virtual machine. This means that that cloud infrastructure now starts to become a service. This is making this infrastructure into a service. You can add now applications, perhaps, without changing the underlying infrastructure. Only when now the demand for more infrastructure is actually realized do you add into the physical infrastructure. This means you've really decoupled the complexity of the applications from the underlying infrastructure. And you get much higher degrees of efficiency. And more importantly, now this becomes a service. And as a service, you can optimize that. You can say, I want that to be fully automated. In fact, I want that service to be so automated and self-service tools up above that I only need to go back into that data center once every week to replace the broken components. I don't want to file trouble tickets. I don't want to have an IT department that's responding uh, to issues like this. We need to be able to move to full-scale automation. And that's really what cloud computing is about today. Of course, now the applications have to be managed themselves, but that creates another industry of people who want to do application management up in this kind of a virtual space. In fact, now customers now start to think about things. They forget about the infrastructure entirely. You're on an Amazon Cloud or Rackspace or Terramark or any of these things. You stop forgetting, you start not worrying about what machines it's actually running on. Instead, you get to be concerned about your applications that are running in this virtual space. So we really are moving towards where there's now a, a virtual data center that are being created. Now, to really get the efficiencies of this, however, you want to have lots of customers. You want to have lots of workload. And this now makes a very interesting proposition because you start to smooth out demand. So some of the businesses that might have you know, seasonal characteristics or day-night cycles where they need more resources and less resources, that can start to average out over a larger number of customers. 
Again, each one of those steps is a change in the operational model that drives down the cost. And that's how we can approach this kind of 10 cents per hour per server because of these efficiencies that you get there. Now, in the past, we approached very large-scale problems by building special purpose machines. Um, there's a Cray machine on the left and a connection machine on the right, two different architectures. One was the fastest serial machine. The other was the fastest parallel machine. I got an opportunity to work on both and did a lot of the design on the one on the right, which was a large-scale, very large data distributed architecture. It had 65,000 processors. They were what's known as bit serial processors, so you'd take a 32-bit processor and you would actually divide it up into 32 individual data streams. But you actually started to program this as if you had a virtually an unlimited number of processors. I was doing a lot of machine vision work at that time, and it was very easy to say, I, my image requires a million pixels. Fine, I, pres I will presume that I have a million virtual machines, and if I want to add two pictures together, I just simply add them in parallel. And we let languages and compilers do all the work underneath this. The problem here is that both of these machines suffered from the following you know, problem is that we had to design the processors for these machines. We had to design the operating systems. We had to design the computer languages, the compilers, and the applications. It was really too much, and you weren't taking advantage of a full industry around it. In fact, today, if you look at what's known as GPUs because of the gaming industry driving down the cost, they are basically equivalent to one of those connection machines today. And that's so now gaming industry, which is a high volume business, has replaced the specialized uh, supercomputer business. And at that time, of course, nobody really expected the internet. Uh, this is what the internet looked like in 1977. Uh, it was really rather small. It was a bunch of universities that were doing largely file sharing and, and kind of terminal sharing. Um, and, this, and at that time, we had no idea what was about to come. This was really for universities to kind of share research. And today, of course, I think that the internet can probably be considered the world's largest computer. And in many ways, in our own experience as consumers, that's the way we view it. We type in a URL. We go to some application, we just expect us to get there, and that, that computer is now giving it to us. So I think we've actually entered this age of sort of large-scale computing. This is actually connectivity. And, and it, there's a number of very pretty visualizations of the Internet. This, I'm sure, does not reflect at all the entire Internet. But we've now entered this age of very large-scale computing, and the other thing is this large-scale computing that's available to anyone. Those supercomputers, you had to have grants, to, you had to be at the right university, you had to either be in Europe or in the United States or travel long distances in order to get access to those machines. Now, with cloud computing, you actually can get access to very large computing resources anywhere. So, in fact, it's this kind of this democratization, I think, of high-performance computing. Uh, there's always been this top 500 list by Jack Dongara uh, of the world's fastest machines. Uh, it's been going on for like the last 20 years. And this last year ranked number 42. It's been Amazon's web services, which is their public cloud, which you can get on. Anybody can get on this. And in fact, you know, it had essentially somebody put together 2,000 servers to run this benchmark and compete in this. Uh, and it reached over 240 teraflops. That's a trillion floating point operations per second. Um, in fact, you can rent your own if you want to try it yourself. Uh, it costs a sac approximately $1,000 per hour for you to have these 290 servers running at, at essentially 63 teraflops. Uh, and you've got over a petabyte of storage for $1,000 an hour. Of course, you probably will spend at least an hour getting it set up and another hour getting, taking it down. But think of the power that now, if you have an application that really wants, that, that can use that kind of power, you simply can get on and do it. And it doesn't require you to spend the connection machines we're selling for $10 million and up. This is basically $1,000 an hour. So that's a fundamental change in this kind of democratization, I think, of computing. As we continue to drive the cost down, we're making even these high-performance machines available to anybody uh, who has a credit card to get online and do it. What's also interesting, Amazon has, has moved into it's showing the Adam Smith analogy here. There's now a spot market for computing as well. In other words, the spare cycles that they have, the available mach machines that are not being used, they allow a spot market to be developed. So you can bid for those. 
and whoever has the lowest price will actually be able to use those machines. So instead of $1,000, you might get lucky and only spend $400 for an hour of that. And it is a spot market, which means that the resources can be taken away as somebody else bids a higher price and everything else. So for certain classes of applications that you really need them to be up, that's not a very good idea. But actually, a lot of the kind of data processing we would be talking about in the rest of the session are these longer running tasks that, that if, as long as you get it done within maybe a week, that might be good. And if it gets sort of near the end of the day, okay, you'll buy real, you know, reserved instances so you can get the job done in the time period you want. That flexibility is the other key attribute of cloud computing. Now, what else can we learn from, a lot of this is actually coming out of the large scale internet web company, the Googles, Amazons, um, are the sun running our infrastructure. And there's a very different approach between the way enterprise software has been designed and where this web software has been designed. Remember, enterprise software is for employees. You know, it's your financial systems, your ERP systems, and things like that. They're not very large scale. They're very mission critical, supposedly, and they have these kind of failover models. Um, and largely, they've been developed by the commercial software industry. In the web space, it's almost the complete opposite. It's really a small number of applications that are running over a large number of machines. They're designed, when you're running on a large number of machines, failures are a fact of life. And matter of fact, failures happen every minute, every hour. So you just have to assume that they're going to happen. You have to design applications that can be resilient to this. They're also very much information centric, built largely in commodity systems, and they're largely based on open source. So we clearly are moving, I think, into this age of like these warehouse scale machines. This is one of Google's data centers uh, located up on the Columbia River. And if you sort of squint your eyes, it begins to look like a circuit board with, with components that are laid out on it. Those are the new computers. Those are the new integrated circuits, basically. And inside of each one of those warehouses now are tens of thousands of machines that are essentially running one or two applications. Gmail, search. Those are the things that are running spread over tens of thousands of machines. It's a very different paradigm. And of course, we're also seeing then different kinds of analysis tools uh, being developed. Hadoop comes out of MapReduce. Actually, it's a very old kind of style algorithm originally in APL and in SCAN and on other kinds of instruction sets. Um, but it's a design for distributed processing. And because it's a nice framework, someone who wants to use it just gets to write it. One, two different kinds of functions, one which is a mapping function and another which is a re reduction function. And the framework takes care of it. What's interesting in the cloud, you can have this framework now that can flex. It might get, use a large number of machines for a certain part of this and then reduce it down to a smaller number. So that now you actually have a shape to computing uh, the resources over time. Uh, one of the great examples I always like for Elastic is Animoto. There's a simple site that you upload a picture and an MP3 file, and it gives you back a movie, an MTV, MTV movie. Well, they uh, went on the social, you know, they launched on Facebook and took advantage of the social graph, basically. It got very, very popular, very, very fast. They're a little startup. They had like 30 virtual machines running at 10 cents per hour on Amazon, and all of a sudden, virally it spread. And fortunately, it was a very simple algorithm that just put a of work, this customer wants this job done, this movie rendered, and it had workers that would take things off of a queue. And it had a monitor that's sitting there watching that queue, and oh my god, all of a sudden the queue got larger and larger and larger, means that it was taking, it, the user response was getting poorer and poorer, so it spun up more workers. Well, in a three-day period, it grew from 50 virtual machines to over 3,500. And at the time of this, I was actually in one of the startups, and I just could not imagine going down the hall to my poor IT guy and say, by the way, Joe, you know, we overestimated. I mean, we underestimated. I thought 50 machines was going to be enough. Well, right now it looks like I need 500. And then come back like six hours later and say, no, 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 not 500. Make it 1,000. And come back six hours later, no, no, not 1,000. Make it 2,500. You just could not do that with ordinary infrastructure. This is something you can only do, this kind of elastic computing in the cloud. The last thing here and then, what, with some of the newer activities that's going on is that now there is a movement in open source to really, essentially, the software that you see at these major cloud providers such as Amazon and such, let's make that open source. So that anybody can build a cloud. Any university can build a cloud. Any business can build a cloud. Any other service provider can build a cloud. So that we really can take most advantage of this. 
So in the end, I think rather than seeing actually a consolidation into one or two very large cloud providers, I think that we're going to actually see a world of many clouds. There will be different clouds that will specialize into different vertical areas, uh, largely because of compliance reasons, reasons and things like that. I talked to financial services companies. They have very different requirements, banks, for running things in a cloud than a movie company. And healthcare, of course, has different regulations, and pharma has different regulations. So all of these things, it would be nice if we have the same kind of cloud computing model, and we let, again, the operational requirements driven by the vertical needs of the industry differentiate. And of course, I think there's even a larger cloud on the horizon. And as we're getting into sensors, as we are moving the cloud out into our cars, where we have entertainment devices, we actually want to do mesh computing. I want my car to be able to look ahead and talk to the other cars to understand why the traffic is, is backed up. All of those things just create larger and larger opportunities for this kind of cloud, including buildings. So I wanted to leave you with this thought in, in talking with people here at Qatar. I've been very impressed by the sort of ambition and the scope and the, the broad thinking and that, that I've observed here. And so I wanted to really get people here thinking about, consider instrumenting and collecting data on, from our world at a scale that's never been done before. Things like scale is something that, that Qatar is really about and really looking at very seriously. And there's data everywhere. So if we start instrumenting all of the buildings, all of the roads, all of the cars, all, all of the in different parts of the environment, instrument, you know, actually get all the genomic data we can, create these very, very large public data sets, data sets that are available to scientists who would be able to do incredible experience, incredible research on those things. And with live streams, be able to model these things and make predictions as to what they would expect to have happen in the data because now it's coming to you in a live stream. And this will be based, of course, on building these kinds of tools and services so that to allow the, the scientists to do their job. So I think in the internet age, you know, Whatever, you know, platforms at the end of the day have the most users, the most data, and the most developers are the ones that are win, that will win and move forward into the market. So thank you. Unless there is a pressing question, I'd like to uh, uh, ask you to hold your questions till the end. If you have five minutes, I'm going to ask everybody to, uh, to join us here, and then we'll collect uh, questions about the whole theme. Uh, next, we'll uh, have our second speaker. Uh, Chris is going to talk about uh, data analytics to us. So now we know that we can munch on lots of data, so computing power is not a problem. Let's do something useful with it. Thanks, Ihab. Yeah, so I'm Chris Ray. I'm from the University of Wisconsin. And a lot of my research has to do with data analysis and building systems to manage data and use all those cycles that are we just found out are going to be cheap and free throughout the cloud. So what I'm going to tell you about, actually, is one of the main projects in my group, which is a project called Hazy, that I uh, created really in response to two trends that I felt were really critical to the future of data management. So the first trend was kind of touched on in the previous talk. And that is today, data are available in an unprecedented number of formats. So for about the last 30 years, people have been obsessed with sort of record-oriented formats. In the last 15 years, with the advent of the web, people started to care about text. But by volume, this is actually a very small uh, area of all the data that's available to us today. There's data in formats like video, audio, speech, uh, OCR, and sensor data. And last, in the last talk, we heard something about how we're going to take sensors and stick them into all kinds of different cars. Well, that's already happening inside the U.S. In fact, there's an ad that runs in the U.S. for this company, Progressive, where they're taking a sensor, sticking it in your car, and then they're going to charge you insurance based on your driving. So this age of actually monetizing all this sensor and new kinds of information is already here. The second trend that Hazy tries to capture is really a continuing trend. It's the idea that there's a continuing arms race to more deeply understand your data. And the reason I use the phrase arms race is that even incremental changes in how well we understand our data can have huge, huge benefits uh, to the people who are doing it. So for example, if we understand our data slightly better than a competitor scientist, we'll be the discoverer and they'll be the also runner. 
If we put out some kind of marketing tools and we want to understand how our ad campaigns are doing, that will be the difference between maybe a $100 million loss and a $10 million loss. So there's really this continuing press to take in all this data, understand it, and use it for value. Now, one thing that I observe, and I more, have a, more of a math background, is that when I look at these two kinds of applications, these two different themes, I see something very common to both of them. And that is that statistics plays an unbelievable role here. So statistics has really been the area of data analysis for the last 50 or 60 years. There's no question about that. But actually, when we deal with this new kinds of data, we have to actually acquire it and understand it. So when those sensor readings come in from my car, I have to stitch it together somehow and understand from those braking events and how much you're accelerating that you're a good driver or a bad driver. And that's really the area of statistics. So what this project is about, what I'm going to tell you about over the next couple minutes, is this trying to find sort of these common design patterns, these common themes of how we take these individual diverse looking applications and unify them together in some way. So we can find common abstractions to build systems that are easier to deploy and maintain over time. So to put it a different way, what Hazy is all about, or the thesis of the work, is that the next great breakthrough in data analysis isn't in any individual algorithm. It's not going to be making a better regressor, a better support vector machine, something like that. It's actually in the ability to sling together all these different data sources that are going to be out there and cheaply available to us. To build tools that allow us to build, deploy, and maintain the existing solutions that we already have available more effectively than ever before. So what I'm going to talk about, really, uh, now, is two applications that we've built with Hazy, and we can start to see this common structure. So each one of these applications has, a very common, has two parts that are common to them. One is something that people are doing now. People are doing sort of these kinds of applications now. But since we're academics, we don't have a competitive advantage to work on those kinds of things. We're going to be working on sort of futuristic applications. So one of those things that people are doing now with these new kinds of sources of data is that every company that I'm aware of right now has products in the marketplace, they're running ad campaigns, and they're wondering how their consumer-facing entities are actually doing. Right? So what is the reputation of their agents in different areas? Now that data has never been more available in any time in human history. It's constantly generated on the web, uh, blogs, Twitter, and Facebook. It's available ready to be consumed. And what companies are doing right now is taking all of this data, consolidating it into reports, and then passing it back onto these businesses to tell them how well their products are doing in the marketplace. Now what's interesting to me is that they've already uh, started to create a library of tools that they use to lower the cost of actually this acquisition process. Things like conditional random fields. They take a sequence of words from text and try and figure out where are the products mentioned in this tweet or in this blog post. They try and figure out if this text is positive or negative about a product. And so they use things like support vector machines. And so they're starting already to use these statistical tools to make this process a reality. Now, what we work on, as I mentioned, is not what people are doing today, but what people we think are going to be doing in the future, and looking at these things that sort of these kinds of applications on steroids. And so the kinds of projects that we work on are things like machine reading. So in machine reading, we're given a large corpus of text, and our goal is to try and answer sophisticated questions over that text and prove our answers to a human reader. So for example, list all members of the Brazilian Olympic team in the corpus with their years of membership on the team. Now let me just walk you through this application for one minute to show you how this works and what goes on to answer these kinds of questions. So the system that we built to do this is a system called Felix. It's this bar here. And what it gets as input are a bunch of different data sources. It takes in a crawl of the web, the clue web. It takes in a structured database called Freebase. And it takes in this news corpus that it's trying to read. And then what it has to do is basically solve two different problems. The first problem is to read all those texts and find out all those named entities, or what would be the products and the people. And that's a process called entity learning. Once it knows all the entities that are there, the people, the places, the things, it starts to try and find relationships between them, effectively automatically from the text. And in the parlance of text analytics, that's called slot fill. Now, to build this system, we actually learn something pretty interesting. We learned that basically two features were absolutely critical. So the first feature was that this system, Felix, didn't try and invent from scratch all the different ways to analyze and understand text. What it did is take existing tools that were already available and combine them together. What? Sure, you can ask a question now. Yeah, with your entity linking, I mean, this isn't a trivial problem, right? Because you're going to miss a lot of things. You're going to have 
errors, you're going to have mismatched uh, entities and so on and so forth. So you're doing an approximation of this entity link, and you're doing actual... Um, Excellent question. So exactly, we're doing this statistically. So each one of those things, when we see a piece of mention in text, some string, we can't perfectly match it into our list of entities. And that mapping could be you know, one to any number. And so we have to keep around that uncertainty in this first part of the data flow to understand what are all the possible mentions, what are all the possible entities that it could map to. And then later we're going to try and actually resolve it uh, at the end. So it is a very messy, hard problem. So it's like a, a cheap join? You could think about it like a cheap join if you wanted, but it's really a, right, what's going on here is a very rich sort of statistical kind of uh, rule-based system that I'm going to talk about in a second. So it really takes almost everything that we know about, all the linguistic cues, all the classification, all the extraction tools that we know, and it pushes them all into one big system. And then from that, it's actually deducing this, this text is really this entity. And our strategy really is to try and find as many sources of evidence as are possible to compute that. Excellent question. So but we're, what we realized, though, when we went to build this, is that if you tried to build this whole thing from scratch, it was a non-starter. It's a very difficult problem. So rather than do that thing from scratch, what we do is take each one of these pieces and combine them all together and allow them to speak together jointly. So if you're a math nerd, what I mean here is that we're able to make a protocol so that all of these different components can actually communicate to, get to one another in a very principled way. A second thing that we learned was that it was simple transformations were critically important. So being able to take all of this data, filter it, and put it together very rapidly allowed us to get extremely high quality in a small amount of time. So the key, again, is to marry these simple, robust statistical tools with very simple abilities to filter and transform data and to be able to scale to terabytes so we can suck in all of those different data and get as much of that signal in as possible. Now, one challenge that we did just to demonstrate how well this kind of methodology works is this thing called the TAC-KBP challenge, the Knowledge-Based Population Challenge. This is something that's worked on by linguists, computational linguists, and a bunch of different people. The state-of-the-art systems in this area gets TAC scores, or F1 scores, which are the mean of precision and recall, the harmonic mean, in the 20s. But with one, basically one graduate student working for a couple weeks, we got in the 40s on this test. And the reason we were able to do that was really because we used simple existing tools and we slung them together in creative ways, which is supporting that thesis that I was telling you earlier, that simple tools rapidly combined can yield very, very high quality. So in Hazy, we're not just looking at one application. We're not just doing text processing. We're really trying to understand how all these new data sources and all this new analysis is going to impact the applications that we build. So the next, part, the next people that we partnered with right away to understand these statistical applications are these people called IceCube. And what IceCube is is a bunch of physicists who are trying to understand the formation of the Big Bang. So let me tell you what IceCube is, and then I'll tell you what our role was here. So IceCube, these physicists are great. IceCube is a 30-something co uh, country collaboration, a couple hundred million dollars. Uh, it's run out of the University of Wisconsin. And what it actually is is a block of ice that's at the South Pole. It's a gigaton of ice, a kilometer cubed of ice, three kilometers deep. And what they've done with this cube of ice is they've instrumented it with sensors. Each one of those little lines there is a strand of sensor separated by about 10 meters. So on each one of these little sensors, there's about 80 per strand, are these digital optical modules. And what those things are looking for is light. But they're not looking for light from the sky. They're actually looking for light that's passing through the Earth. And the reason is that they're using the Earth like a gigantic filter so that the high energy particles pass through, emit light, and they can track back these things they're looking for, which are called neutrinos, and different flavors of neutrinos. Now, the way this system actually works, because they're at the South Pole, is kind of interesting. This is where we come in. So the particle shoots into the ice. All this light goes off into the sensors. And then an algorithm has to decide, is it interesting or not? The reason it has to decide if it's interesting, if it's one of these neutrinos they care about, is that they have to ship that piece of information from the South Pole all the way back to Madison over a satellite. And they can't simply keep track of all the different sensor readings that are present. Once it gets into Madison, they're able to do lots and lots of data analysis on it. But if they say something's not interesting, they're not going to see it till the next plane gets down there in six months. So it's really important and critical that they're able to identify those interesting events right up front. Now, my student actually works in the poll section, but he also works in the upper data analysis section. And both of them are heavy with statistics. But what I'm going to talk about is what happens at that pole thousands of times, hundreds of times a second to identify those neutrinos. 
So what happens is a particle shoots in. And you don't get to see the particle. What you get to see are its after effects. Light shoots off, and it sees something like this. The sensor sees some amount of photons with some amount of timing information, a diagram that looks like this on each one of those sensors. Now, this may sound kind of shocking, but the same model that's used to take a document and find all the parts of speech or find all the named entities, the people, places, and things that are in there is almost mathematically identical to the model that's used to track neutrinos. Now, as a systems or a kind of math person, this is extremely interesting because it means there's common structure across many, many different applications. For the experts, what's going on here is these are called convex programs or regularized inverse problems. And we're able to pose them in one way and solve them in one way and have sort of a generic modeling tool for all of them. So again, the tricks that we played here were that we combined simple filtering when data was obviously incorrect with sophisticated regression, and we were able to reconstruct these neutrinos. Now again, to validate that, you may think, well, they just played around, the physicists were nice, they're at the same university. They're going to be running our code in 2012. So the detector software that's actually down there, that's detecting these neutrinos, will be the code for my student. Now, I told you each one of these applications had something in it that was both what people are doing now and what people are sort of doing in 10 or 20 years. And this one seems to only be doing what people are doing in 10 to 20 years. But the reason it's critical is that many data analysis who are right now controlling you know, the, the money of data analysis or the interesting data analysis are actually ex-physicists. And culturally, the data analysis that they do is far different than the things that people do in fields like data mining or those other areas. They're doing things that just have a different repertoire. So this is very interesting to us that we could take these simple ideas, push them into their system, and have real benefit. And in fact, they're so excited about it that I said, we're moving up the stack. We're starting to analyze more sophisticated kinds of neutrinos, these higher energy events that have difficult statistical signatures to detect. So what do I want you to take away from this? Really two things. The first thing is that statistical processing enables a huge number of applications. It's not just in text processing. It's not just in sensors. It's not just in understanding consumer behavior. It's really a fundamental shift in how we understand our data. And it's a great use of all those free cycles that are now around. A second thing is, if we're going to build these systems and we're going to enable every single person to come into our cloud and do data analysis, we need tools for them. We need abstractions for them. And the first challenge is just a common thing where they can reuse and build these things very quickly. Now, I don't have the answer here. We've just started work on this. But what we propose is a first sort of unified abstraction that is built on some solid theory in math, which is convex programming, together with some solid things that have been around for a long time in data processing, which are sort of simple filtering and querying language. And marrying those two together has already given us great results. So with that, I will uh, end by plugging my students. So we have a bunch of other things that people are doing. Uh, I mentioned all those rich forms of content. We have some recent work on understanding OCR and understanding speech data by a student in Kumar. Mark Wellens is the guy who did the trigger software in IceCube. Uh, it turns out that there are still some innovations to be made in machine learning. Uh, we're still doing some work there on scaling up these really large scale kinds of uh, computations, sophisticated ones like matrix uh, completion with database vendors. Uh, and we're also looking at maintenance. I mentioned a lot of use and reuse. But actually, what happens as the data evolve over time, as new data comes in, as feedback comes in, these systems need to adapt and evolve. And we've started trying to understand how to maintain them in a low-cost way over time. So you can set up your application, and it just runs for you, much like a database would do for your old order processing systems. So last, I'm just going to really talk one second about two future directions. The first thing we're doing is in those text analytics spaces, we're going even farther. We're trying to build a high recall version of Wikipedia. What this means is we're going to try and find not just some mentions of entities on the web, but all of them. We want to find every mention of every entity anywhere hiding in the web, in news, in video, in OCR, anywhere. It's going to be entity-centric. We're not talking about string matching. We're talking about really resolving what entities are there. And it's going to have rich content. Right now, when Wikipedia tells you something's true, it has to point you to some kind of text page. But why can't it point you to a video? And in fact, in our demo that we're building right now, it can. It can find exactly where that relation was validated on you know, BBC News. A second direction that we're pushing is into this deeper analytics, trying to understand, as I said, more of the stack, more of the things that are out there that physicists and these type of people are doing and seeing if we can provide help. One problem that we stumbled on, which we now have, we believe, the fastest algorithm on the planet, and posted on my webpage, and people sent me nasty notes, uh, was this thing called Jellyfish, which is the fastest matrix factorization algorithm that we're aware of. And we have some new theory there. Recently, we've been contacted, which may be of interest to some people here, uh, by some oil and gas companies. 
uh, because it turns out that factoring big tensors, not matrices, is a way a lot of people uh, reconstruct acoustic signaling data, and it's something that we're very interested in, and as I said, I have a math background, so tensor, ex tensor factorization is something that I like and think is fun. With that, I'll conclude. Basically, uh, what I said is the challenge of what we've done is to discover a powerful framework to deeply analyze diverse sources of data. What HAZY is is an initial attempt to attack this challenge. The technical idea at a low level was to borrow all this great work from mathematical optimization and programming uh, called convex programs and combine it with simple data processing. Everything that I talk about here, the code, data, and papers are all available on our very beautifully branded website, on the HAZY website. Please download us and give us feedback. Thanks so much. and defining the rules. So I, I give you an example. For example, in, in the Sidra Hospital we're building here, not only that each of the component systems have their own business intelligence tools, but we have also enterprise intelligence. So we have this problem that you talked about, in, you know, integrating um, uh, the different uh, platforms and, and doing their business intelligence at two different levels and so on. So we have all of those. But most of the time, the reason we have all of these layers is because we need to hire domain experts that, that, that tell us, you know, these are the important things to look for. In here, you're either looking for sim things that are simple or, or I mean, to the degree to extract these kinds of now, I don't want to over, I'm not overclaiming here, I hope. I don't say that we're going to get rid of domain experts entirely. My point is there's a lot of things that can be automated. And the interesting aspect, I think, is actually what you're talking about. How do we make their jobs a little bit easier? Because a lot of these automated tools, actually when we build them, we do put someone in the loop. That grad student who was working for a month, the system is constantly recommending and spitting things back to them. And they're giving little bits of feedback. Now, that interplay, the human and the computer, and how you put them in a loop, a domain expert, that's a very interesting problem. But it's not one that's really within my wheelhouse or skill set right now. So it's something I'm looking for collaborators on. Of this thing? So, uh, so right now, we're running on the entire English web crawl. So it's about only about four terabytes of data. We have a 50 terabyte crawl that's cross-lingual that we're able to run on right now, but it hasn't been processed. So, so the web is the So scale. it does not depend on the context. It's just an interpretation that you say, I find this word or this relationship. Uh, no, actually, we are able to run the deep linguistic parsers, like the ones from Chris Manning's group, who's a collaborator with us, over the entire web. We're able to use entire ontologies, like the Freebase ontology, and a wide variety of structured databases to do this. So it's not that we're doing anything shallow at all. In fact, the system that I showed here, actually, each word gets blown up to have 46 million semantic features that are there. And part of our special sauce, or our secret sauce, is the ability to run the logistic regressor at that kind of scale, at several terabyte scales on you know, hundreds of machines. Now, we haven't moved it over to a cloud infrastructure, but we have some friends at Greenplum who have given us a 130-node cluster to run on, and we're able to do that. Um, that's how we're able to process. So we really take and leverage all the existing semantic tools that are out there, and then we basically bake them off, if you like, with, the, with this sort of feedback loop and rules. And that's our secret sauce. But, but doesn't it depend on the question that is asked? Right now, it does not, but that's a good point. In the future, we'd very much like to be able to be question-focused so that if we know you're asking a question, there's some very material hints there. We now only take advantage of that in a very surface kind of way. Eventually, we'd like to push that in, and that's something actually a student is working on. Right now, it's sort of the old-school model of just hit the web with a bazooka and put everything into tables. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, now introduce uh, Dr. Siham Amriahia. And uh, Siham, is, as I said, heading our social uh, computing group at QCRI. And uh, she's going to talk about social science behind social computing, which we're all excited about. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Siham. Uh, OK, so uh, the title of my talk is, uh, Why do we urgently need a uh, science of the social web? 
And uh, let me uh, first start by uh, uh, just getting this uh, done with. Uh, I think I have one of the easiest tasks. There is a lot of data out there, but in particular, on the social web, there is a lot of data, <laughs> okay? And uh, uh, this was simply from The Economist. It came out uh, recently, but, and uh, I, uh, for those of you who don't know about this uh, issue, uh, uh, I basically recommended there are uh, several articles on uh, simply, you know, the data deluge and having so much data out there. And uh, uh, in particular, of course, the social web is, uh, is a good example. And, uh, uh, you know, who is not on Facebook? I mean, everyone is on the social web. Just to let you appreciate this uh, New Yorker uh, cartoon, which uh, I'm appreciating uh, even more uh, from here in Doha, I like uh, very much the New Yorker. Um, and, uh, and who is, you know, this is, you know, uh, is, uh, a, a quote from Facebook but, uh, concerning Facebook. There is, uh, there is uh, Twitter out there, there's Flickr, there is uh, things that rhyme and don't rhyme. But, uh, uh, you know, and who's not, who's not following something on, uh, on, on Twitter, right? We're all following uh, people where uh, we have opinions uh, that we express. So, uh, actually, even my father is on Facebook. And he, uh, he, he went on Facebook because people told him, uh, uh, you know, that's where you can find, uh, find her about me. And, uh, and in fact, we were, we were in July, we were at MIT with uh, Ahmed and others. And uh, in the middle of a meeting, I, I received this uh, note from my dad who sent posted it on my wall the minute he, he joined, and he, he says in French, we can't follow you, uh, where are you? Here, all is well. And uh, anyway, so, um, and, and uh, you know, for the anecdotes, since I'm uh, mentioning my parents and, this, this, and social media, uh, my mother was visiting uh, me here in Doha, and, and uh, she, we were having dinner with Ihab, actually, and uh, at some point she goes, thanks to social media, our people are expressing themselves. Okay, <laughs> and, and I go, Mom, you don't even own a cell phone. What do you mean, social media? Which is true, she doesn't. And she looks at me and she goes, you know, Twitter, Facebook. <laughs> and then Ihab goes, do you know your daughter works on this stuff? She looks at me and she goes, really? Uh, because that's a good thing, because I, I don't understand it. So, in fact, talking about understanding, you know, this data, um, what, do, what, what, do, what do we have to understand this data, right? I mean, there's a lot of it. There is a lot of analytics going on. Uh, but w what do we get offered as end users, right? We get offered this stuff, right? We get offered things like, this is uh, Yelp. Uh, uh, Yelp is a, a restaurant review site um, where basically you enter a bunch of reviews. It gives you information about restaurants. But really from an end user point of view, from a consumption, right, of what's going on uh, point of view, what do we get? We get stars. We get something like, uh, this restaurant has received uh, 3,472 reviews. Okay, big deal, you know, helpful. Uh, you know, we, 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 get, we get other things that are you know, relatively similar. You know, this is an opinion article from Al Jazeera, uh, English. And uh, uh, again, we get things like uh, 819 Facebook likes and so on and so forth. So very coarse aggregates, right? So Chris mentioned, you know, data, data analysis and uh, understanding, you know, the data for the purpose of understanding it. But I think, you know, understanding data in the context of the social web has to somewhat be social, right? I mean, we need to be told more than just, you know, there's this many people who, who like this article. And uh, to, to dive into a little more details, I mean, actually there's sort of a trend, a relatively recent trend in providing a bit more information. So uh, this is from INDB, uh, and it's giving you, you know, average ratings, but it also gives, you know, ratings. Um, it breaks down the number of reviewers, overall reviewers, but also number of reviewers who are among the critic, right? Um, it also, um, you know, uh, what else? Uh, there is a score that gets averaged among critics, among, uh, among um, uh, everybody. Okay, so, so there is sort of a trend into trying to open up a little bit that sort of black box of course aggregates, right? And um, in fact, there is even more now that's, that's provided where uh, there's a breakdown by demographics, right? And the breakdown by demographics is telling you, you know, things like among these demographics, this is how the, the ratings um, uh, are distributed. And uh, of course, you know, we always want to answer the current questions but push things a little bit further. One argument that uh, uh, goes against this is to say, well, of course, this, these are predefined demographics, right? Who tells me that these demographics are the most appropriate for this data set, right? Um, and, and so the, uh, the, 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 the question that we had initially was that, well, of course, you know, the, the user has sort of 
really is, 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 is going between examining you know, all reviews and reading every single review. And um, in the context of Al Jazeera, for example, the data set that we uh, got a hold of is opinion data, opinion articles from Al Jazeera English, the number of uh, uh, comments from, from users for a particular article ranges between one and over 900, right? Is that right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's actually a large number of, of comments from users, right? So, I mean, going through every single one of them just doesn't make any sense, right? It's not scalable. Or getting some of these overall aggregates. And, and so what we, uh, one of the pieces of work that I, uh, I did that was published in BLDB this year was um, to leverage structure, to uh, use structure that is either hidden in the data or provided by the data to, uh, to explain ratings, right? So this was in the context of movies, but one can think of it as being what is structure, and in particular in this case, the structure is features of users, so demographics, for example, and features of the items, or the content items that are being commented on or rated, right? It would be movies, it would be articles in their topics, and so on, okay? So just to give you a sense of the, uh, of, of the problem space here and what we, we, we looked at. So I'm going to sort of dive into this one in particular. And uh, we actually looked at two problems in this context. One is uh, what we called meaningful description mining. And that was to, given a set of items, and just think of it as being a single item for now to, to simplify, to find groups of reviewers, groups of users online, uh, who consistently share similar ratings on items. And of course, be able to describe them. And that's the, the important part, and that's what I meant, providing a social understanding by uh, surfacing or by leveraging the structure or by leveraging the demographics of these users. And uh, an example of, set of this problem is to be able to say something like, given this movie, uh, teenage female reviewers have rated this movie uniformly, their average rating is 9.2. Right? So now we're moving from these coarse aggregates into a, a using you know, robust statistical measures that talk about uniformity, for example, of ratings within a particular population that, of course, is dynamic right? and very much depends on the input uh, set of items that we're considering. Right? The, uh, the second problem is what we, call, we called um, difference mining. And the difference mining, so while the previous one was given a set of content items, and looked at finding groups that are uniform in their, uh, their degree, uniform uh, in, in their ratings. The second one is about comparing groups, right? Identifying groups of reviewers who consistently disagree on item, item ratings, right? And this, so now the output is not just a, 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 single, uh, a single group, but it's something like this. So uh, if I take this movie, again, contrasting that with what current systems are providing, sort of these aggregate ratings, right? What am I saying here? What, what, does, what does this problem, I mean, what's a possible answer is teenage female reviewers and male middle-aged reviewers have rated this movie inconsistently, uh, meaning that they basically disagree. Uh, their average rating is 7.5, and it's telling me that um, uh, one category uh, uh, loved this movie while the other category hated this movie. So why is this powerful? I mean, this is powerful because we are now, ha we have a tool that's able to compare two dy dynamic populations and do that according to the input set of items. And, and, and um, however, I mean, just to give you a sense of the complexity of the problem, uh, if you think of all these different dimensions, right, the item dimensions or their features and the, the user dimensions and their features, the, the, uh, the problem can be modeled as a, as a cube space, right, where think of every single combination of every single value of every single feature of every single of items and every single combination of every single value of every single feature of, 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 uh, of users. And so this creates virtually like an enormous uh, uh, cube and each, where each node determines, identifies a particular uh, subset of the population rating the subset of the users of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the movies in, in this case. So for example, so all the way at the bottom is all uh, combinations of user movie rating and somewhere in the middle the one that says uh, users who are in California uh, and are single, right? Uh, and, and all their ratings, right? So obviously this is computationally, uh, it's computationally very intensive and it's very hard to find on the fly the, uh, uh, this, the populations of users that we want to identify as being uniform in their ratings or cons consistently disagreeing in their ratings. Um, so, so this is, so I'll leave you at this, we, we have a bunch of heuristics and algorithms that 
that uh, prune the space and and so on and, and uh, so the the, uh, the 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 continuation of this is this piece of work that uh, I've been doing and really enjoying here with a bunch of students so Samarin and Aisha and Amira mm -hmm. What did you mean with the filters of this lattice structure? Yeah, so the, fi the, 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 the filters are the value combination of values. So, for example, your input here would be uh, this movie that's called Schindler's List. We already have its, the values for its attributes, right? And the question becomes, where, are, where, do, I, where do I start? That, that determines a certain a number of starting points in the, in the matrix. Yeah. But then the question becomes, how do I efficiently navigate the matrix to find all possible groups? Right? So we use uh, like a hill climbing algorithm to do that. Okay. Um, right, so, uh, so, so, so bringing this into the, the world of news, so this is uh, actually a running demo that I invite you to go and try and play with um, that we built uh, with um, Sofian, who joined us from Versailles, Amira, who is from Qatar University, and uh, Samir and Aisha, who are from CMU Qatar. And uh, just focus on the middle part. So this is uh, the input is a set of opinion articles from Al Jazeera that have received comments from users. And, uh, and, and so this middle part is all the sentiment map, right? That is basically characterizing demographics of users. So it's users based on demographics and the distribution of sentiment that we extracted from the comments they've posted, right? So right now this is, so this is one static view of it, but we may, we've made this dynamic in the sense that one can identify different topics or identify different dates uh, for which we're extracting different user populations. And currently the demographic information is just the location of the user. But you could imagine wanting to explore uh, uh, different populations of users and their opinion on uh, different articles around certain topics. Okay? So that's uh, one application. So the second piece uh, of, of work, uh, yeah, that I, I wanted to mention really quickly to sort of give a sense of scale, right, in, in, in this context. So there is one, one, one direction that is, you know, understanding the uh, different populations and the distribution of ratings, or in this case, the distribution of sentiment that they have online, uh, and being able to dynamically uh, find those populations. The second one is, to, is a much simpler problem that is, uh, just to give you a sense of, of, of a storage question and, and, and the volume of data that's required, then that is about if we were to uh, want to find the most popular items in a particular population of users, right, So and search over that. So think of it as being searching over social recommendations. And I want to simply give you a sense of, you know, what are the challenges in terms of storing the data and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, enabling sort of uh, dynamic search over recommendations. So I'll just skip this. And I'm going to define a very simple data model. So the model is their users and they're linked, UV, 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 okay? And uh, the network of a user U is simply the set of all users connected to him. So the user, uh, the pink user has three, uh, three, uh, three friends. And assume that these friends are tagging items, right? Or everybody basically is, is tagging items, right? So I have this uh, triple of user item tag, right, information. And, uh, and the user in this context, in the context of the social web, is to wear, uh, has, is wearing two hats, right? He's either a seeker or a tagger, right? So now let's assume he's a seeker and he's interested in finding content items uh, that are relevant to a particular dynamically provided query and, uh, and, and that are popular in his, his own network, right? So uh, given a query by a seeker you, we want to efficiently determine the top K or the most popular items within the user's network, meaning the ones that have been tagged by people in this user network with query terms. Okay, so let me define a very simple way of sort of determining uh, the score of an answer. So for a given user, for a given seeker U, a tag T, right, and an item I, uh, I want, I'm going to define the score of I for U T as simply the number of people in the user's network who've tagged this item with T, okay? And I'm going to define the score of an item U for a query Q as uh, just some monotone aggregation of these individual scores for every single term in the query, okay? Now, let me try to solve this problem. So, of course, this reminds us of web search, except that it's in sort of a social context, right? So different users will potentially have a different set of answers because it's about finding uh, content items that are popular in the user's network. So there is a straightforward way of thinking about it that is simply to create an inverted index for each user, tag, or term pair 
right? Where the items are stored on a, a decreasing order of their score or their popularity in this user's network. And this happens to work very well. It actually leverages existing algorithms that are able to threshold uh, uh, the, uh, the, the navigation and avoid having to scan the lists. Okay, so let's assume you can do that for every single user. Basically maintain an inverted index for every single user term pair, right? Then it works pretty well, actually. Except that, let's take a conservative example, I mean, actually a toy example, right? So in the case of a toy example, we have 100,000 users, a million items, 1,000 tags. Uh, generally, you know, they're only, it's a long tail, they're only a small number of taggers who tag the items. So anyways, doing the math, we end up with one terabyte of storage, right? Oh, well, maybe one terabyte is not that bad. Yeah, we could use uh, clouds. And <laughs> but, you know, you get, you get the idea. You get the idea and you, basically what we've explored, you know, in the, this other piece of work is a, is a way of, of leveraging uh, uh, sort of intersection or, or, or commonalities in behavior. So the uh, one, one, one idea is that here are different users for which we're storing all these lists, right? And if these users are, share enough people in common in their network, then potentially they could be clustered uh, uh, into a single sort of user pool for which we maintain a single index, right? And I think really there is sort of a lot of uh, uh, you know, potential in, in, in using shared behavior at every single layer of the uh, sort of data or social data management stack, right? And this is one way to do it at the sort of storage layer itself. So, uh, so just to, uh, to conclude, uh, I think the, the social web offers unprecedented opportunities to acquire data, so extract valuable content, and, uh, and, and more generally run uh, large-scale population studies. However, we need scalable storage and maintenance, so uh, I, I uh, briefly pointed at that at the end. Uh, understandable analytics. I mean, there are a lot of analytics out there. There are a lot of tools, you know, that produce numbers and... But being able to overlay uh, this structure that users relate to in particular demographics is very important. Um, and, and also it's important for not isolating populations of users. It's important because we're able to convey that there, is, there are different populations that users identify with or not. Like, I, I want to know who goes to these places. I don't want to know who likes that. I want to know who posted positive comments about a particular topic. Right? I want to know who posted negative comments about a particular topic. I want the system to simply tell me people who are affiliated with this organization which we don't like are posting positive comments about this because maybe I want to read that article more than any other article. Okay? Um, and, and so I, need, I think for that we, we really need the science of the social web. We need to stop you know, building those like little, little tools that do like one or two things and we need to think you know, as, as a community as, uh, you know, ar around sort of these analysis dimensions, right, and, and how they get combined, and in particular the social ones. And, um, and, and, and uh, that's it. And, uh, I'll let you this. Thanks, Niam, and um, uh, thanks for sticking to the time, everybody. Um, really proud of all of you. Uh, uh, last but, uh, lot, uh, but not least, uh, Dr. Stefan Vogel is going to talk about, uh, uh, that's the last talk in this session, and uh, I'm still hoping to have a few minutes at the end to, to get some questions. Stefan is going to uh, talk about uh, digital village and from data to knowledge, and uh, we're all excited to know what that means. So, Stefan. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm talking about language technology and the digital village here will come in as a kind of uh, motivation. Let me see if I can operate this. Yes, okay. So originally, most of the population actually did live in villages, right? And uh, So uh, when we think about it, uh, what is the situation in such villages? Common environment, right? Also common history, common culture, 
common values, right? So there is a lot of shared uh, wisdom and so on, shared values and common language. Okay, things have changed since then, right? So there is now easy to travel around the globe, right? Within 12 hours, I can come from the U.S. to here, right? Business is around the globe. Also, information and communication is now nearly instantaneous, right? I can send an email. It arrives within minutes. I can have a meeting with my students who are in a different continent. Right? I can interact with people all over the world. Right? So we have faster and safer transportation, modern communication technology. So I don't need to go actually to other places um, in many cases. Right? And the next step is now, and this is somehow how curious to me or uh, creates a bit strange. So the social networks now actually go back to the original village in a funny way, right? So we have all these little connections. So in a village, I knew 2,000 people. Now I have social networks where I interact maybe with a couple of hundred people, right? So there's this nice visualization of the connectivity in, uh, in Facebook. Right? But now it's different from the original village. So now uh, people live in different environments. They have different cultural backgrounds. They have different history, different values. And above all, they speak different languages. Right? So both in business and now more and more in the private space, I interact more and more with people who are very different from myself in different aspects. And of course, my specialty over many years has been to work on uh, language and language translation, so this is what I want to uh, focus on. One interesting part is people still gossip, right? So I know when my daughter is going to a party on the weekend, even so she is in a different continent, right? And I know it maybe within hours, and by the next day I may see the pictures posted by a friend that my daughter is then had. And this is something which remains the same. So previously in the village, when I went shopping and I didn't greet my neighbor, by the time I came home, my parents already knew that I hadn't greeted the neighbor. Right? And now it's the same going back again. I know when my colleague is going for a beer in the evening. So information exchange and communication in a multilingual society requires learning foreign languages, as many of you have mastered uh, several languages, right? this is good. Or we can hire a translator or an interpreter to help us out. And here at the conference, uh, we have the services. I think up there, there are people who actually can translate for us. Right? Or we can develop machine translation. Right? So ask for technical support in this. And it's not an either or. Actually, we should make use of all of these. So. Now, focusing in on translation, right, uh, I just want to um, give you a little bit of background uh, what the state of the art is in this, in this area. So often you will hear arguments about um, differences between statistical and grammar-based translation. Actually, let me just go here. Yeah. Okay. So, consultancy. Okay. So, different, different paradigms, different approaches to machine translation have been developed over the time started out with school-based translation, which is close to what we have learned in school, how to analyze sentences, and how to maybe, when we learn a foreign language, how to translate now in other sentences. In recent years, a different approach was developed, uh, which learns from data, which is called statistical uh, translation. And people often compare these and, and see them as a contrast. Actually, I have a slightly different view on this. So I think these are two different dimensions which we are dealing with. One is to model how we can go from one language into another language, right? And so this is how much structure we want to put into our models. And then another dimension is, if we have alternatives, how do we decide to deal with alternatives? Which one should we pick, right? And there it is helpful if we have information, what is more likely and what is less likely, instead of just having some yes, no decision, which is really pretty arbitrary. So we can put different approaches which have been developed over the time into this diagram down here so that we have a flat structure or a deep structure and that we don't use probability 
in our decisions or we use um, probabilities in our decision, uh, decision. And so example-based machine translation, which is here, has a fairly flat structure and has a best heuristic decision tool. The deep structure here is used in transfer-based translation, in the lingua-based translation. So there is a lot of structure motivated by the linguistics knowledge, uh, but there is no help in deciding between alternatives. In statistical translation, we started out with fairly flat structure, and we first concentrated on uh, assigning probabilities to these alternatives. And of course, the holy grail is to have deep structures and then also probabilities. You are going to construct probabilistic models in a situation like in deep structure where the set of interpretation is incommensurable. How do you define this, the probabilistic measure in any sense? So we define it by looking in existing data, right? How have people used these different structures? Which is more likely, which is less likely, right? And you can condition this very often on additional information to make a better decision. And actually, I will uh, explain a little bit in the next slide how we can learn from data, right? So by looking at data, can we extract some knowledge which helps us then to make the decision in these situations? So in statistical translation, we actually rely on existing data where humans have translated uh, sentences, documents into another language. And what we now do is that we actually use this data to extract valuable uh, knowledge. We call it the translation model, so we try to model how we can map from one language into another language. We also use something what we call language model, which essentially gives us information about what is typical structure in a given language, which sentences make sense, which sentences don't make sense. And once we have these models, then now we have a program, so essentially we replace now the human translator here by a computer program which can do the same, which can take some sentences and generate some output. And the goal here is that we can translate sentences which we have not seen before. And this is where the value of the statistical approach comes into play, that we cannot only repeat what we have seen before, but we can generate something new. And this is where we need to learn knowledge out of the data that we can work with. So the advantage of this approach is we can rather quickly actually train for new models. Once we have the framework in place and we have existing data, we can uh, train new, uh, new models. There are also, of course, some drawbacks. We need this data. So if we don't have all the data generated from human translators, then we cannot train the models which we need. So here we see that we are operating on data, source text and target text, right? And then we want to extract some useful knowledge. And can we do this, actually, this transition? So bear with me a little bit to go through some um, example here. So I want to show you how this learning from data actually works. Right? And this is what you can do manually. So we have here a parallel corpus. Right? So we have found a piece of paper or papyrus or something where we have the same document, we assume it's the same document in two different languages. And I mean, this happened many times, right? The Rosetta Stone and so on. So when we look at this, so this small number of sentences we have here, but we can make some observations. We want to de decipher now which word corresponds to which word, right? Can we build a dictionary? Can we build a lexicon from this data? So we can make some observations like the uh, Apinaya. I don't know if it's the right pronunciation, but so don't. So, and you don't know, so it's okay. So we can uh, find that apinaya occurs in some sentences with kukra and apa, right? On the English, so in, in apinaya we have some distribution, and on the English we find the and uh, verbs as high frequency words, right? So the first guess is that the word for in apinaya, apa, which occurs five times, could probably correspond to the verbs verb here. Right, so just looking at how often particular words occur, I can already make some 
educated guesses what may correspond to what. And there are other information. So monkey occurs in the first and uh, third, uh, child in the second and fourth, man in the fourth and sixth. And I can look at distribution where words occur in the corresponding uh, language. So by looking at frequency, by looking at which position uh, words pro uh, occur, I can make hy some hypothesis what may correspond to what. Right? And so I can build now this information out of this. And so I've generated here the word list for the two languages. And actually, there's something strange going on. I have more English words than Apinaya words. How can I deal with it? Maybe some, some English words have no correspondence. Maybe some Apinaya words have actually multiple correspondences. Right? So I need to analyze this in, in more detail. And so I built here the word frequency list, which gives me some additional information. Right? I have written down these um, hypotheses, which I can draw from it. And then I can go even deeper into this analysis and can say, let me look into the distribution in which sentence occurs which sentence. Right? And then I see pretty nice correspondences here uh, in, in these different words. Right? And some words occur in few sentences. And for some, it becomes very difficult because they occur only in one sentence. Right? So for when I look, now look into the inside the sentence, I can learn something about the word order in the different languages. So I go over the entire corpus, word frequency, distribution, and so on, to build an initial dictionary. And now I need to fill in additional gaps by looking inside the sentence for the ordering and so on. And to cut it a little bit short here, um, so the missing points here are these two links here because I have words which occur only in these sentences. So I have no information about distribution frequency and so on. But looking at the sentence and extrapolating from word order, which I can observe in the other sentences, that adjective follows noun or vice versa, adverb follows verb or vice versa, where I see differences in these languages, I can actually now fill in these gaps. So this is actually what we do in statistical translation going over the corpus, but now not manually doing this analysis, but designing algorithms which do this automatically. Right? And so we can look also at part of speech information, word class information, and so on, where I can always draw some uh, observations and interpret it and fill in some gaps in my knowledge. The interesting part is, if I now have this information, I can actually start to translate sentences I have not seen before. Right, so this source sentence, Aparats Ni Met, I can now look into my dictionary, put in the corresponding words. I can do the reordering information, which I have extracted before. So I do reordering, and then I can do a better lexical choice to generate a new sentence. Okay, so this is what we do in learning from data to actually translate new sentences. And translation here is only one example for many approaches in natural language processing where we can learn from data. Right? And so I go over these examples quickly uh, in the case of time. So we can, from the information we have to have extracted, we can translate now actually in both directions. So the underlying approach now to do this automatically is what we call here in word alignment. So here I have drawn these correspondences from word to word manually, but this is what we can learn at actually automatically. So there are statistical learning procedures which can generate these alignments for sentence pairs fully automatically. And from this, we can then even extract uh, entire phrase-to-phrase -phrase correspondences, not only word-to-word -word correspondences. Right? And sometimes there is some conflict in alignment, so I should not extract this one, but the entire, entire region. So now we have not only extracted word-to-word -word correspondence, but even phrase-to-phrase uh, -phrase correspondences, and we can take it one step further and pass on both sides our, our sentences and use the alignment information to even learn subtree to subtree information. So we get more and more structure into our models. So this is going from the flat structure to the deep structure. Right. So we want to learn from data. Right? I have shown a very simple example where most of the words could be identified clearly, which corresponds to which. In typical cases, when I take uh, this text here, and a couple of, uh, of sentences, it would be very hard to build this dictionary. So we need more data, right? We need to scale it up, take more and more data, 
when you have 10,000 sentences, this is about a book, right? You take an entire stack of book, or maybe an entire shelf, and this is what we actually have done over the last 10 years. We have scaled it up more and more. So these days, we are training on 10 million sentence pairs, right? So we have about that much of data available in more than one language, maybe Arabic to English, data from the United Nations, from US, and so on. And so we are now analyzing this amount of data according to the principles which I have highlighted before, frequency, distribution, across the corpus, distribution is in the sentences, and so on, to actually build now these models which help us to translate new sentences. And actually for the language model, which I mentioned before, we go up another order of magnitude. And when we then go to Google, they go up three orders of magnitude. So Google has trained their language model on two terawatts, right? I think this is more than the Congress of, uh, uh, the Library of Congress uh, contains. Right, so going up. This is parallel data, which is very good to extract. For many languages, we don't have this amount of parallel data. Then we look into what we call comparable data, not parallel data. So for example, here we have articles, which is not really a translation of each other, but we find subsets which are corresponding. Right? So we can extract these paragraphs and go inside and find correspondences. Right, so we can use more and more data because we allow that it's not only parallel but only partially parallel. Right? So this allows us to use most of the data on the web when we find corresponding documents in different languages. Right here, another example where we can extract now partial information by analyzing from the document level to the paragraph level to the sentence level. Right? Often we have the problem that there is no parallel data to even start from and as I mentioned, we can use then comparable corpora, uh, or, uh, and there are many efforts actually to build initial dictionaries, like the Rosetta project, dictionary, and so on. Right? So the question is, could we even use other approaches to learn from data how we map from one language to another language? One example could be to use pictures as a kind of interlingua, as a kind of non-language representation of meaning and of concepts. Right? So there is this interesting language labeling game where two people log in and they type in some words about the picture until they agree on something and then they get points for it. You can do this monolingually for English, right? So you would label here, it's rose, it's flower, it's yellow, and so on. Here we have flowers, grass, clouds. So words repeat, right? You can do this in some other language, let's say in German here, right? And so we get a cloud of words here and a cloud of words here which now again become a kind of comparable corpus, right? And this can be done monolingually, so we don't even need an expert who can say this word corresponds to this word. By looking at the picture, we have kind of language independent representation, but we actually can learn from this kind of annotations. Right? So we can look again into the co-occurrence statistics across this, uh, this information, and we could even uh, go deeper and say, how often is a particular term here typed and given by the players uh, and link this to the other one. So I have actually done some analysis on this uh, because I had access to uh, a data set from a labeling game. Uh, Louis van Hahn had uh, developed it uh, with his students. So when we analyze how many different terms, how large the vocabulary is we get from these uh, games, we see this kind of logarithmic growth. So when we have 10,000 pictures here, then we get about 10,000 different terms. Then we go to one million pictures, so this is extrapolated, we would get about a vocabulary of 300,000 words, which is fairly large, right? And I have also analyzed this vocabulary, which we can learn here, how can we actually compare this to typical test sets which we use in our uh, community, and we get good coverage for these test sets. So the benefit of data. Sometimes you hear that people say statistical approaches, you need a lot of data, right? For translation maybe, unless you have a million sentences, you don't even need to start on it. I think this is not really a, a reasonable statement, right? It's like saying, if you want to learn to play the piano, right? Unless you practice 10,000 hours, you don't even need to get started. I mean, it's always, 
you do a little bit, you get a little bit. You do more, you get more, right? The more you practice, the better you get. The same is with data. We typically observe, sorry, we typically observe these logarithmic curves. So each time we double, each time we double the amount of our data, we give them constant increase. So initially, if you have a, a quick ramp up, of course it's still, still low, and you can get more and more improvement with more data. So let me summarize here. Yes, we learned some data, and we can say, maybe it's a positive interpretation, but I do it anyway. We, cannot, we can say that, we, that our system actually acquires some knowledge. Right? We can translate, or a recent uh, good example was the Jeopardy, the, the Watson game, the Watson system playing the Jeopardy game. People discussed if this is now intelligent. Uh, I would not argue intelligent, but definitely it has knowledge. It can answer questions or generate questions to answers. And the interesting part here is the statistical approach here is that we actually can now not only reproduce, but actually deal with input which we have not seen before. We have built some knowledge about the domain. We have built a model how to deal with this kind of, uh, of data. Right? I have used here machine translation as an example, but as I've already mentioned, many approaches in language processing are using now these statistical modeling and these machine learning approaches. So we learn from data, we extract uh, knowledge, uh, we, we extract information and we build uh, knowledge um, out of this. Right. So more data helps, but I should say also better modeling helps. Right? So we build these models if we want to improve our systems. It's not sufficient to only throw more data at it. It also helps to actually improve the modeling. And I guess I should stop at this. Yes. Thank you. So thanks for all the speakers. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stefan. And uh, again, I am very proud of you to stay uh, uh, with the time limits. Thanks for all of you for staying. And I'd like to. Um, I know that we are out of time, but I still would like to take five minutes or so for uh, uh, for questions for our uh, for our distinguished speakers. So I'm going to ask them to either stay in here or if you'd like to uh, come up there and I, uh, I'll take questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions relates to two of the speakers. Uh, uh, the differentiating between social networking and recommenders. Because my social acquaintances may be more diverse than my recommender system. And how do you how do you address this? I think you probably you know because you're using the linking of the social, and people may use the social network for different reasons than going to the movie or going to the restaurant or. Okay, uh, so yes, yeah, so I think there are two parts in your question. One has to do with uh, diversity, and one uh, has to do with uh, are we, uh, you know, is, is, is the social web about recommendations? And uh, who are we recommending what from, right? And uh, I think, so, so there is, an, we were an experiment very early on when I was at Yahoo in 2007, when Delicious was relatively small. And uh, uh, we observed that, you know, in Delicious, you can uh, tag bookmark websites and tag them. And you also define a network. You, can, you say, I'm interested in these people's actions, and I want to be notified when they tag something, right? So supposedly, we thought, okay, if, if you want to be notified, you're interested in what they're tagging, so you potentially are going to be influenced by what they're tagging. And we simply wanted to look at, you know, does your network, the declared one, the one that you're you know, specifying as being of interest to you, uh, is it a good predictor of your future tagging behavior? And if it, you know, is it, first, is it a good predictor, or how does it compare to uh, implicit networks that are actually the ones that are used by Amazon or like, people who are similar to you in tagging actions? And it turns out it performs very badly compared to people who are very similar to you, also because all these recommender systems and recommender algorithms, you know, sometimes they're not very smart, but they rely on a large, large amount of data, and finding people who are similar to you online, right? Um, on delicious. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a much larger network of implicit uh, uh, connections than the one that you are declaring, okay? Um, the second part that has to do with diversity, I mean, this is a, obviously a very good question. So, so from a technical point of view, obviously optimizing for both accuracy and diversity is a hard problem. So you need to either set a threshold on one and optimize the other one to death, uh, or I mean, this kind of uh, sort of technical question, uh, te yeah, mainly technical questions. So. 
so, be, so beyond sort of the algorithm and, and the, the, the heuristic part of it, that is what most uh, uh, systems are implementing, I think the potential in the, uh, on the social web is that we, we know what these different networks are. We know if they are uh, implicit behavior network. We know that if they are your friends on Facebook. Uh, so it's potentially you know, very easy to diversify from these different, from these different networks. Whether it's what you're expecting, you know, there is a question of user intent, and is it addressing the user intent to diversify? But I think, I mean, these are, hopefully these, ad these address some of your, your points. Uh, some, these are points that address some of the aspects of your question. Uh, thanks, question to Wadi. So uh, I have a question uh, regarding the globalization and the global village. I don't know whether it's just to use the same word, but Glo globalization does not necessarily mean homogeneity. So as an example in the social network context, this is a different part of the world. So it would be interesting to study whether the social relationships that are imposed by, let's say, Facebook are the same, are the ones that people would uh, feel comfortable using here. So the social model, uh, I think, may be different and it's interesting to study or if let's say we we construct a social network from scratch that suits let's say the middle east type of relationships and the same for the cloud uh, uh, computing so the different economic model uh, uh, that uh, realized the or created the cloud maybe this part of the world has a different economic model that may end up a different notion of cloud or maybe it's not a cloud so I think it would be interesting if systems are built from scratch that you may end up with a different outcome that maybe fits more the needs of, of this part of the world. I'm not sure which uh, question is. Stefan, uh, maybe Siham can comment and Liu can comment as well. Yeah. As well. So um, I think I had uh, made it clear that I see that in this kind of digital village or, or global village, the situation is now very different. Right. In the original village, there was this homogeneity. And now I can interact with people who have come from very different backgrounds. And I mean, we see this here already as an example. I see it at the university, where I advise students from India and from Europe and from all over the place. Right. And of course, there are cultural, different cultural values and so on. So I agree. And, and it poses uh, additional challenges. Right. And so language is then only one aspect of it, right? And even if you are able to now do very good translation, right, it may still not cover these cultural differences. And there could be a lot of misunderstanding by not dealing with these things, right? So from my point of view, actually, it's now more problematic, right? The neighbor or the one I'm communicating with does not necessarily share the same values as, as I have, right? Because has different history, different uh, culture, and so on. So from my point of view, this poses challenges. And I hope that actually we as researchers can contribute to uh, bring up some solutions to it. From uh, Lou, maybe? Well, actually, actually, I really agree that we will see different clouds in different regions grow up using different principles around what the cloud's for. But economically, I think, the economics are still going to drive it large scale, you know, the, that are going to be using the same kind of model. But I also think one of the things that we're looking at is the fact that um, data sovereignty issues, national sovereignty issues and privacy of protecting citizens' data makes it almost impossible today for us to exchange data internationally. Uh, and that in itself is going to, I think every region, every nation are going to have their own cloud infrastructure, primarily around protecting the citizens' data. In the United States, we have the Patriot Act, for example, which means that Canadians, for example, aren't allowed to store data on U.S. soil. Uh, all of those things make, I think, more, much more a drive towards regional clouds that will serve different interests, interests that they have in that area. Great. Um, we'll take Mona's questions and question in the back, then I might. Uh, so this question is uh, for UCM. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this whole notion of a science of social um, of of social media, I think is great, and um, to to make it even more personalized. But there is also the challenge of um, people have multiple dimensions, 
So when you're doing this nuanced notion of, you know, uh, female are interested in X, Y, or Z, uh, that could be one dimension of something that I'm interested in, but that I have another dimension that correlates with some other group. So have you looked at this issue of multidimensionality when you're looking at this personalized aspect of social media? Uh, the short answer is no, but um, <clears throat> so, so uh, you know when you're when you're combining these different dimensions, um, one of the uh, uh, one of the key points to reduce complexity is to define like some density notion, right? Because uh, you know it, it, otherwise it's not statistically meaningful to so 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 it, it very much depends on your data and that's dictated by your data. But it turns out, I mean, obviously there is this uh, what they call the downward closure property in, in clustering where at some point when you've combined so many dimensions that you don't have enough items that satisfy it. So, uh, so there is a question of like knowing where, where is it that you should stop in terms of combining different dimensions. And it is not true that having that a larger number of dimensions, conveying a larger number of dimensions to users is actually a good thing, right? Because users will probably only be able to process up to, what, seven maybe? Dimensions. I'm just stealing this from somewhere else, <laughs> but um, so 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 there is sort of a technical aspect to it, which is you know you obviously cannot keep just combining things because uh, it's it's a very uh, 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 big space. But also uh, uh, from and it'd be interesting to see from user studies point of view, you know where where you know where to stop in terms of providing different dimensions. But I think there is also like information from the user himself or herself uh, as to what is this user. I mean you can definitely personalize which dimensions make what you know, sense to, to which user. So I guess... I yeah. think, can I add something? I think your question was more about what happened, for example, uh, my daughter and I share a Netflix account. And so she has her movies that she watches and I never want to see. And I have my movies that she probably doesn't like to see either. So the recommendation engine, which doesn't differentiate, in fact, there's two big clusters there, uh, gives us almost garbage. And so I think that, I mean, a lot of the tagging systems, one of the first things they do is they try to find these clusters around different things and that you can have an individual associated with different clusters because you maybe have different interests or it may not even be the same person on that account which distorts, you know, or introduces a large amount of noise in the system. Great, thanks. I'm holding off on my own questions to uh, keep back. So the gentleman in the back. If I could, I had a question for Stefan. Uh, I, I know that you've worked in the past with uh, these hierarchical phrase-based machine translation algorithms, and I'm interested in um, in working with the dialects, with the Qatari and the Masri, uh, uh, um, for which there's very little text, if any, available. Um, we we had hoped that a hierarchical phrase-based translator would be able to to generalize better than a, a standard sequence uh, sequence translator because there are fewer probabilities to learn. But the problem that we've had in trying to to bring the phrase structure into one of these dialects is that we don't have any tree banks for the dialects, and so we don't have any place where we can learn um, uh, phrase generation rules. And I wonder if um, you know of any work in in uh, inducing a grammar from text on, in a language for which there is no is no written grammar or or any other sort of solution to this problem. So there might be uh, different. Yes, yes, right, right. So there might be different uh, ways to look at it. One is that people have actually induced a grammar from one language through the alignment model. Of course, this actually creates a kind of circle, right? You create something which has errors, and then you use it again to improve the alignment and so on, right? The other thing might be uh, to map through related uh, languages, which I'm not sure if this would apply uh, to you. And then another avenue would be actually to apply what now has become very fashionable over the last two years to do some crowdsourcing to maybe to get things. You are talking about uh, talking about annotations which are not easy to do, right? And then maybe you have to look into um, using specific techniques that you can can improve the technique over time. But we could discuss this also uh, more offline because it then becomes probably very technical. Yeah. Uh, so just for the uh, order of questions, we have Ahmed, John Soma here, John Soma there, and uh, Mansour. And I think we're going to stop here taking more questions, unfortunately, just to uh, to be able to finish in time. So Ahmed, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the talks. I see uh, that people value data. I see that people value also algorithm. And this is great. So my question is about the data itself. It's, it's very nice to have a very large amount of data, but how do 
we select uh, the data that has value. Sometimes, sometimes it's maybe better to select data from different languages to do one problem that is in English, for example, but using data that is in Arabic and using the translation of that data or extracting feature from that data, so it helps. So that gives you actually a different perspective from a different culture uh, to be able to resolve the same kind of problem. So actually my question, what is better? A very large amount of data from one source or diverse sources from maybe different languages, even in a smaller scale, helping application, maybe not machine translation, but applications such as machine reading, for example, such as social networking, for example. Any particular person that you'd like to uh, hear from? Targeting two person, the uh, second speaker, and Siham. <laughs> Since Chris didn't talk, so I'll give you a sure. So the question about how much data should we use and which sources should we select, it's a sticky question. It's not an obvious one. But our strategy has been, by and large, in most of these large-scale applications, that more data seems to win. Now, of course, that's not going to go on forever. But in the machine reading kinds of tasks, if you throw in more data, a lot of these models are very good at sorting out what's good signal from bad signal in a nice, tight, iterative loop. So I would not presuppose up front that one kind of data is going to be more valuable than anything else. Very weak predictors, these things can extract. So um, we don't know yet how to select sources, but uh, more seems to be better, at least for now. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot. So, <laughs> so, uh, so here it is. So um, there's a lot of data out there. I said that at the beginning. But um, there's a lot of sparse data. And there's a lot of dirty data and noisy data. <laughs> so in fact, once you clean the data, you'll end up with small, small, small amounts of data, uh, which is not a good thing. But um, uh, however, so with small amounts of data, you can do a number of things. So for example, we were looking at this um, um, PRISLAB. What's the name of that system that explores uh, news across multiple languages? News Explorer, okay? So one of the things we did is we used a, uh, just a, uh, an off-the-shelf web service to extract entities from uh, articles in English, right? So, so we end up identifying persons and organizations and places, right? Uh, and, uh, and this is very limited because the corpus we have is small. And the, uh, the system that we're using called Open Calais has a very small number of categories. It uses some sort of ontology to find entities, right? And uh, when we looked into that, the, this other system, we realized the way they do a better job than us at extracting entities is uh, that they extract entities in uh, documents or in news articles across multiple languages. Right? And then they use uh, translation and then they use also contextualization to, 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 to figure out what the entities are. And uh, so, so yes, I mean, when you, I think a highly accurate, very large data set would be great. Uh, unfortunately, what we find out there is, uh, uh, you know, smaller sets, but for specific tasks like this one, uh, it works very well. So. Yeah, maybe just as two sentences. So um, one is that People do model adaptation and so on because not all data is uh, good data. On the other side, yes, there are often these observations. Maybe when you go to out of the main data, you get some dip and then more data catches up and so on and will improve again. Right? So it, I would always start from the application and look back what kind of data might be the most useful for this one. Okay, just uh, the issue, it's about uh, business intelligence, for example, whether more data actually buys you something. Actually, if in a competitive environment, you reach a certain point, a plateau, where more data does not buy you more business intelligence in a competitive environment. And so I will dispute a little bit that point. In fact, I showed it in a theorem. Here. So. <laughs> There we go. Everyone agrees that there's diminishing returns for a particular task. That's been well known for almost 100 years. If you're looking at a fixed thing and you're feeding more data, eventually you saturate how well you're going to do. That's known. But the point is, is as you increase the richness of the task that you're trying to do, you can always use more data for new purposes. And there's always valuable signal inside more data. So it's, well, all I'm saying is that as a general rule of thumb, you can extract more information from more data. Is it going to work for a fixed application or a fixed goal? Probably, maybe but not. Probably what you not. said is if you change the task, 
And when you change the task, you are changing the interpretation even of the data. And therefore, you, you almost kind of start over. And no, all, all I'm saying, it's not a, I think we're actually saying the same thing. If you have a fixed task, some amount of data, and you're applying the same rules, the same statistics to it, eventually there's some limit of data where you're not noticing only sort of minimal comeback. I mean, the diminishing returns is definitely going to bite you. So I don't think there's any, any doubt about that. But what I will say is that there's a surprising rule of thumb. And all it is is a rule of thumb. It's not a formal statement. That as you add in more data sources, more diverse data sources, it does buy you value. And that is, that is shockingly true more than I think it should be. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that it's a formal thing that more data gets you something higher. I'm saying, the com I'm, I'm saying that in a competitive environment, actually it doesn't buy you value after a while. No. I have a question about cloud computing for Dr. Tucker. Um, you used the um, analogy that uh, cloud can uh, bring you up to 240 teraflops of speed. But what is the latency of that uh, structure? That is, um, is that a peak speed? I mean, are you really able to do anything at that speed? Yeah, that, that's actually a LINPAC number. So it's on a standard. Um, yeah, but the LIMPAC is, is not a real, that's just a particular a, type of matrix. A, yes, yes. I think your point's a very good one. Actually, what they're using in Amazon on that is actually very low latency links. It's separate from the rest of their public cloud because a lot of the finite element codes and things like that are really very sensitive to the latency. But there's a whole class of algorithms that actually are, that are embarrassingly parallel, Monte Carlo simulations and things like that of which the latency has basically no impact whatsoever. So like many things, architecture really does, the suitability of the architecture for the problem has to be addressed. And we can't just take a single number, so many teraflops, and, and evaluate that. But, but it was just used as an illustration that a publicly available system now exists for anybody who wants to put down $1,000 an hour to have their own supercomputer. And I think that's, that's a remarkable achievement of that. Uh, last but not least. Uh, okay. Uh, my question also to uh, for Dr. Lu regarding also the cloud concept, which is going to be the trend. Uh, two issues is to be considered here actually, which is the security and the confidentiality of the personal and the individual information, where it is all the security issues is being uh, adopted in the service provider. The other thing is the uh, business continuity or the service to be available uh, along the time where some of the incidents has taken place for the Google, for BlackBerry lately. And I it was interested to see the picture of uh, Google data center, which is near the river, where if the flood has taken place, what would be uh, the... Yeah, those are, those are great things. So security and availability, I think, are two very big concerns. Actually, that's only one of an unknown number of Google data centers in which, and they plan on being having outages data center wide. So yeah, that river can flood, and I think Google will be just fine. Um, but the security issue is the, almost the number one issue right now, particularly I think the perceived lack of security uh, when businesses are looking at, at a cloud. And that's pro I think it's really much more a reflection of the fact that we really don't know how secure our data centers are within the enterprise today. And that, but when we see outages and things like that are breaking, it seems to be a much obvious, much more of its target. Just one anecdote, I was at, at salesforce.com for a couple of years. And when I first joined, uh, the number one question was, how can I trust you with my data? My competitor's data is in the same cloud, is in the same database. How can I make sure that no, none of the competitors can actually see my data? Um, and that you, Salesforce as a company had to earn the trust of its customers by being able to really show and through having a lot of audits and everything else that the, it could earn the trust of the customers such that after two or three years, that had dropped to number three. The first concern was how can I count on you being up and available when I need you most? And so I think these, these are these issues that will always go back and forth, but actually are much more, as you mentioned, operational issues, and that people will choose service providers based upon their perceived you know, ability to provide security around the data, um, around what kind of operational personnel that they have, 
ability to pass different audits and meet different compliance regulations. But I, you're, you're exactly right. Security and availability are still, I think, the biggest impediments towards large-scale adoption of cloud computing today. Easy question. Okay, easy question. About the cloud, for users with data-intensive cloud applications, what do you foresee as my way to upload my data to the cloud? Uh, have the data start in the cloud to begin with. Um, it's, it's a real issue, but in fact, if you look at the bandwidth curves right now that are people, people are now actually recognizing they need dedicated links to get into these clouds. Uh, if a lot of the genomic data, for example, coming from the sequencing machines at the Broad Institute, uh, they all have dedicated links going into Amazon and things like that. Um, and, and that's becoming very feasible. I mean, we're at 10 giggy uh, within the data center, then going giggy into the data center that's feasible. Um, but I think one of the questions that would actually going to come up early, once data is at some place in the cloud, either in your data center or in the cloud, it's easier to move the, the program to the data. M moving data to the program, which is the old way, is almost virtually impossible. So be careful. Wherever you decide to put your data, it's going to stay there a long time. And in fact, right now, the biggest, the most highest bandwidth is FedEx. And in fact, most of the cloud services now provide that kind of service. If you have to put don't use the network, use FedEx. With that as a great closing remark, I'd like to thank all of you for sticking around half hour uh, beyond the uh, timing. This is great uh, turnout. I uh, appreciate your time and patience. Hope you liked that session. I'd like to extend uh, our uh, appreciation for our distinguished speakers, Dr. Lou Tucker, Dr. Stefan Vogel, Dr. Sihan Amriyahi, and Dr. Christopher Ray for uh, this wonderful session. So thank you all again.